We're going to continue now with our panel discussion. And as I promised you, we only have ladies here joining me on the stage. Um, so I'm going to sit down here and then I'm going to ask all the uh, speakers to join me as well. Uh, so first of all, uh, Budil Ellen uh, Grodem, uh, she's a teacher of basic cyber and inf information security from Norway. So you can join me here on the stage. Then we have Krista Lisette Margaret Lajuste, and she's a student at the Tartu Dama Gymnasium uh, from Estonia. You can also just come and have a sit here and girls you can you know sit down already here uh Billerin Silakivi and uh, she's also a student at the uh, Dartu Damme Gymnasium um then we uh have Kathleen Girna uh, she's a cybersecurity consultant at the GGI Estonia and also a teacher um so we're gonna uh, get to that a little later as well. So you can also have a sit here. And last but not least, Ruta Birta Dreyman. Uh, she, she is the senior research uh, at the Riga Technical University from Latvia. So um, go have a sit here and then we can start our discussion. So the reason we actually have these young ladies with us here on the stage was that we were discussing that, okay, these kind of conferences are great. I mean, grown-ups discussing about like what kind of future should we kind of build for, uh, for the next generation. But why don't we actually come here and ask these people our, or these young, uh, young minds by ourselves? What do you need? And, and actually, my question for both of you uh, is actually, how can we make cybersecurity more attractive for the students? And do you have any kind of examples uh, that you already have seen in your schools or in your life uh, that really have worked? And, and what actually made you to uh, be more, if I may say so, like attracted to cybersecurity that you feel like you actually have an interest in that sector? Uh, I do think that uh, starting earlier would uh, help a lot because I only started uh, coming or uh, interacting with the cyber security in gymnasium or high school and uh, a lot of people already have developed their main interests by then and uh, don't really want to try that many new things and uh, I think the different competitions like the one going on downstairs are a great way to expand the horizon of young minds. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to add as well? Uh, I think teachers uh, really help towards uh, making women more interested. If a teacher knows what he's talking about, um, like my teacher, <laughs> then it creates interest and it makes you want to learn and it makes you want to study it and uh, that kind of snowballs into you know, working in the field. But if we talk about especially gamification, like we, we, uh, we actually have the main topic right over here, uh, what aspects of gamification actually have you find the most appealing? Or especially if you think about different kind of, you know, there are games and things that you can do more interactive. Do you have any examples, like things that you have used and, and this really had helped? Uh, because obviously when you, when you think about or when you just say to your, your friends about like a word like cybersecurity, usually it's, it's in a lot of people's head, it's just like, science fiction somewhere but uh, but it, it, it is actually very easy and and there is a lot of companies and we're gonna get to the, uh, these examples also from the GGI as well um, the application that they have do you have any experience that there you have used some kind of you know applications games and phones that, that really have made it more easier for you for like the younger people to understand about that I don't think I can recall any uh, only Basically, the only thing is the competition, Cuba Boring. I really loved that uh, it was out of the blue. I had no time to prepare and uh, we just could like dig up information. For example, you got the PNG file and you had to search the information from that. And yeah. yeah. What about you? Uh, I really like uh, problems and I like problem solving. And so when some of the questions were more from the viewpoint of someone you know, trying to help like a family in need, then you can kind of turn that around and think what would you need in that situation? And like how, how the person helping you uh, could actually help you. Mm -hmm. And so putting yourself in that, uh, you know, victim, victim's shoes is uh, really helpful for me to realize how I actually need to do it. And so the questions were um, built up to kind of support that mentality as well. But if you would bring it out, I am, and I just 
just kind of try to match it in a way. What is actually missing from your classroom today if it comes to uh, the, the cyber cyber topics as well? Do you feel that these these kind of topics are being discussed enough or or how do you feel? Like, is there anything like messing in your classroom when it comes to, you know, especially cybersecurity? Uh, or you think we should like add a course or two for in the curriculum because uh, right now we only had uh, one course and that course was just multimedia, multimedia, and uh, that was all kind of kinds of different things. And one of the small portions was cybersecurity. And I think we could expand on that. But um, but let's turn to you, actually, Ruta, as well. Uh, if you could just bring it out, then I, I think also, Gatling, like we, we discussed before as well, that you're also, you know, teaching in, in, in different, you know, um, different levels of education. Uh, what really is working in a classroom? What gets the attention from the students when it comes to, again, how do we teach them cybersecurity? Ruta, Gatling, who wants to start? You can start. Or, no, you wrote that. Sorry, you can start. <laughs> okay, I start. Uh, okay, I uh, my name is Bodil oh. Ellen, and I am from Norway, and I am a teacher and uh, very interested in cybersecurity, and uh, I have um, run a national project called CyberSmart for for people in high school, uh, but I uh, I think it's what you say it is not got to be something beside it must be included in the in the curriculum and uh, uh, we have uh, done this uh, from 2018 and uh, I was uh, funded from the national government to to go to uh, America to Tulsa University there because uh, what can we learn from Americans they have done this for 20 years. Uh, to awareness of cyber security uh, and in Norway we were blank and uh, we are teacher we are not the technologies uh, so that's why we have to start uh, on a very low level and also we invited uh, professors in Norway from all uh, many different university to come together and they had the same aim to educate the young people and teachers in cybersecurity but the first thing we uh, uh, reckoned that it was too much theory and we, we lost it mm -hmm. on the way. So we said if the teacher's not hanging, uh, running up to, to feel confidence, we will not teach anyone. Mm -hmm. So that's why we have to start with the teachers and teach the teachers. And we asked the uh, US Embassy in Norway to fund some of the professors to women in a university in Tulsa to come to Norway and teach the teachers because then we will bring it to more students. So we've done that a lot. We have done a lot of camps. We have done a lot of experience and we have evaluated and we have come to the same conclusion mm -hmm. as the young here say, to make it more practical, uh, more interesting, have competitions. So so we have done that mm -hmm. just to... But, but, but going to Latvia, any kind of examples from, from your side as well, or especially when we think about the research, like the role of research in academia when it comes to gamification in, in cybersecurity, like in the educational field as well. Do you have any, any examples that you could bring out that really has worked well? Um, yes, I can bring uh, some really recent example. Uh, it's part of the project. It's founded by Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway grants. So we yeah, are actually working together Estonians from Taltec. Uh, it leader is uh, Vilnius University. Um, yeah, then we have also military university from Vilnius, and uh, we have uh, NTNU and also Alfund University College uh, from the Norway. And also we have University of Liechtenstein, so actually we are a big consortium who are working and uh, really looking on how to actually build this education uh, of kind of future to make it uh, firstly interesting to students, secondly also uh, that it's aligned with the workforce requirements, and the third that it's not only about technical technical skills, but good mix of soft skills, technical skills, and also behavior aspects. That's why we have also a psychologist in our team to actually um, understand what are those behavioral aspects, what are important for cybersecurity specialists. 
Um, and one of the recent examples was escape room. So it was a hybrid escape room. It was called Cyberscape. And uh, on those, we had uh, like uh, teams uh, in the rooms, and they needed to find uh, three different incidents concerning organizational incident, uh, logical incident, and also physical incident. And uh, during that game, uh, uh, basically what we did, we incorporated uh, like also this communication and collaboration skills uh, because uh, in incident management, it's not enough only uh, kind of find the incident. It's also really important to uh, communicate in an efficient way. So we did this uh, first experiment mm -hmm. and actually the biggest, uh, the biggest improvement was an engagement the students felt really engaged on the topic. And currently we are uh, kind of evolving the game. And so our uh, aim is to do it like once per quarter, just to more engage young, young specialists uh, to, to start their career. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kathleen, like actually talking to you now, uh, and um, you're wearing two different hats, if I may say so, so that you're working in one of the companies that have developed an application or a gamification app. Um, and, and at the same time as well, you are a teacher. Um, so you're also helping the kids to, to learn uh, about cybersecurity and, um, and a lot of other things as well. Um, kind of your examples are what is the biggest challenge when you have developed these applications that it's just like, if, if it comes to, okay, I, I would put it in a way that like, um, there are people that are actually developing these applications. Do we actually know exactly what works well? Or especially do you consider the feedback for, from, uh, from the students, from the users, do you really like also change the application itself as well? Well, we do. You do. Of course. <laughs> uh, but um, I'm going to answer, answer your previous question, this one together, because mm -hmm. what I've noticed um, from, I do a lot of visits to schools, and I also, um, as, you, as you said, I teach, I, I teach at univer uh, university level as well, and, and we do research this as well. Um, my research interests align there as well. And uh, when I talk to kids in school, uh, in, I teach uh, gymnasium or secondary school, high school level, whichever you call it. Um, so my, but my game is for younger kids. But there's one thing that is um, sort of running through all of it, and uh, people like problem solving. They like exploration, and uh, it it can be an app. It could be it could be something simple as well in class. Like uh, one thing that I do is okay today everybody come up with a phishing campaign. So I put them in groups. They come up with phishing campaigns. Mm -hmm. All right, give me the phishing campaigns. <laughs> all right, see you next week. And then next week I distribute them to other kids and say, fix it. So how are you gonna mm -hmm. how are you gonna battle mm -hmm. this fishing? Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to games, you know the biggest problem is making a, a good game. Money. Because uh, a lot of educational games and also cyber education games. There aren't that many cyber education games, but there are some, and I have seen uh, many. So uh, when it comes to cyber ex education games, they usually have two problems. Uh, one is that they are quite often project based, which means that they get uh, money from you know some of the one of the grants here or mm -hmm. or you know you know where the grants are right. So they get the money from the grant, they build the game, and then that's the end of that, uh, and then it dies. But uh, the other problem is that they are if you want to do it exploration style, where the kids actually wander around. Um, that is more expensive. It is cheaper to do it more text-based, uh, or you could explore, like there is a game where you wander around, and, and it is a game in the sense that you walk around, and you encounter a thing, and it asks you a question, and you solve that problem. But it's linear. And I, one feedback I once got, because I got my uh, school kids to test different games for me, and, and one feedback I got was, I liked uh, the other one more, my one, my one. Um, but I like the other one more because I could decide for myself what I want to do. Like I'm going to go talk to this person and now I'm going to do that. Uh, but the thing is, the more sort of open world you make it, um, especially if you want visuals there, if you want accessibility aspects there, it is very expensive to do this. And uh, yes, you're right that you need to also gather feedback you need to change based on feedback. Um, but again, there are costs involved. And um, uh, I, my experience is this. I really like your game. Yeah, it's great. 
uh, our company, would your company be interested in, in uh, being with us on the game? Yes. Uh, would you be willing to uh, put up some money? Yeah. Oh, no. No. So it's it's money mm-hmm. that's usually probably the biggest problem. Uh, because, I mean, you know, competitions like downstairs, look at the amount of sponsors. You know, look at this. Uh, these things are expensive. And that's why they're difficult to put together. Uh, but we do know what works. Mm-hmm. But uh, but any examples from from Latvia, from from Norway as well? Like you mentioned about, like, did you learn a lot about, like, from from the U.S. Uh, examples as well? Like, do you feel like your governments are actually prioritizing this again? Like, when it comes to the money, I feel okay. We we do have the private sector. I mean, these people are going to be their next workforce. But I mean, at the same time as well, every single government should also allocate more and more money there. How do you feel about like? Let's start with you. Like yeah. with the Norwegian example as well do you feel it's a prioritized topic right now or it need i mean obviously it needs more attention but like uh but but how, how would you reflect that side yeah uh, i was in the uh, have the same uh, uh as her it's the money it's it's stop with the money we, we run now a, a same project and we have two school vet uh, vocational school from uh, Estonia with us with this uh, uh, European project but then we build uh, and we make and we test but then it stop so how can we share it with the population because uh, we can do a lot of project with and try to to share knowledge in the cyber security but if we don't reach only three schools here one school there no it's a very big country and we are in the south i am the west so so it's difficult so uh, now i'm trying to get the government to to give more money to to uh, to share the knowledge but even if this project started with the government they asked me to run it but it was uh, in washington they had the, like this uh, they come together i said and some of the uh, professor and tools i said we do this can, we can help you even though we, there is no money left mm-hmm. so so we struggle with that all right but yes. the latvian example um do you feel regarding especially the government's kind of again uh how much do they actually focus on, on, on these topics? And and when it comes to, I mean, uh, research institutions, universities never have enough money anyway. Uh, so, so so that's also, I mean, one very tricky tricky part there. But uh, but but how would you reflect? Uh, I said uh, I think that in Latvia the situation is quite um, similar that um, in, in neighbor countries. Uh, but um, the good thing here is that uh, we have a lot of funding from Europe. So <laughs> at least we have funding from uh, like lifelong learning when we can provide some uh, programs uh, from university. Uh, if you're looking on a government level, then I would say that currently focus is more on military. Mm-hmm like things to educate for military purpose Mm -hmm. and like general education, cyber hygiene as such, um, I would say that maybe currently it's less prioritized. Mm -hmm. Um, Do we have any questions from from the audience so far? Uh, As I said, it doesn't happen often that we have such young ladies with us here on the stage. We do have one question here. Could we get the microphone? It's here, yeah. So this is, I'm trying to get empirical information. I'm using Dungeons and Dragons to introduce cyber security. Did you play Dungeons and Dragons? Uh, No, I never really got into that. Um, I I played more of the alone games. Okay. And the other? Uh, No, I've heard of it, but I've never played it. Because I'm finding I can get uh, leverage there in the distribution of of, uh, gender in Dungeons and Dragons games at that latest high. So I... We created a Dungeon and Dragon type game, and we get we got more genders that way. So mm-hmm. we, it's better to cross sell security than to specialize it. Mm-hmm. Right. But I, I, if you don't play Dungeons and Dragons, but you know a lot of your friends that do, or uh, I don't think some people. I have never heard anyone who played it. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I, it, it's it's popular in Norway. Yeah, right? I know. I have, like, I have heard it from the internet, but I don't have any friends uh, who play okay, it. Okay, no problem. <laughs> any any other questions from the audience? Hands up? No. No hands so far. 
Okay, I'm trying to see which is the lights. Um, but uh, but actually asking from, from both, of, both of you as well, what do you think, what's the right age to, to actually approach skids with uh, with cybersecurity topics? Should we go? I mean, uh, some of the previous speakers in the first half of the day talked about also, um, like Mikkel's like, he is skid, uh, can take, you know, robotic classes already from the kindergarten. Um, what do you think? When should we approach you guys and be like, okay, here we do, here we have a nice game because, like, I mean, most of the kids are born with these things in their hands. Mm -hmm. uh, should we, you know, start as soon as possible, or, or like, I mean, if you even think by yourself, when did you actually get the first like interest that you felt like you would like to learn more about cybersecurity? Uh, I think that uh, we should start teaching kids from as early as year one already about the cyber hygiene. It's really important. Like I was on the internet a lot as a kid and I could really compromise my data. But uh, luckily I had uh, a father who was really tech savvy. But I do know that many kids didn't have, and uh, many kids in my classroom, they kind of got like, yeah, they their fates weren't that good. Many data leaks and such. Yeah, I think definitely you should start as early as the kids start using internet, which is really early, um, because all the security, uh, I think, is really important for absolutely everyone to know about, just to keep themselves safe. Mm -hmm. We we talked about role models as well here, and and actually uh, the thing that I've been always thinking about as well is like kids are always on their social media, especially teenagers following a lot of you know influencers on their social media platforms and everything. Should we? Uh, do you think it will work if we would actually include also more you know famous singers, you know social media stars, in in order to really promote these things that that kids would actually be like, okay, she's very cool, and 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 I I'm following her on, on her social media platforms, and and she's talking about their solutions that mm -hmm. they they have helped them. Do uh, so you think like approaching especially uh, like these these stars that uh, that we really, you know kind of influence the younger people would work as well for you? I think it's worth a try, definitely. But you have to get a lot of different people in, not just from like uh, sports influencers or beauty influencers, but pretty much everyone you can find that would mm -hmm. actually do it. All right. Um, let's move on to the again the other side uh, from 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 the very end there as well. How do you envision like actually the future in gamific gamification in cybersecurity, if, especially if we talk about like technology uh, technological like uh, achievements or you know involving different kind of threats that are arising as well. What's the future in that field is going to look like, or what's kind of the emerging trends that we might see in the future when it comes to you know gamification uh, in cybersecurity? Yeah. You know, I think it's very important what uh, Stuart said to to use gaming in the in the teaching methods, and I think do you have to start with the teachers again, uh, but also uh, we do in uh, when we have a cyber week, uh, and we make a, a all week uh, from in the uh, vocational school, and we stop the ordinary on. Uh, uh, time and only and invite the police and we invite the uh, the community to talk about their uh, the future what do they need and the young people and we make also a competition we call it uh, not escape room but a breaker box so they have to to do solve a lot of things and use uh, gaming but we need more gaming we need more uh, materials because uh, it's, it's expensive, we have drones, we have uh, mini spherical balls they program, but uh, it is expensive to run this uh, for a school. Mm -hmm. But uh, but Kathleen, uh, you again talked about the, your uh, gamification solution and everything. What kind of partnerships do you have? Or again, you, you said about like okay, a lot of people would say yes, like we can you know work with you and everything, but like uh, that they are not like able to finance anything. But like especially with the schools. Uh, when it comes to private sector companies launching such kind of solutions, how easy is it actually to go knock on the doors of a school or should it work, which way should it work proactively so that uh, do really like companies would have to go there and be like, okay, uh, you know, we have a solution, maybe you want to buy it, maybe like, you know, but for schools again, again, we go back to the budget side. So, you know, it, it's it's pretty tricky, but uh, but should it be more again that uh, that like, we actually have the budget uh, for, for, uh, for schools? schools to actually implement these solutions as well? Or? 
Um, I would say there's lots of problems in in, mm-hmm. in this question. Um, I think, first of all, uh, it depends on what kind of things you want in schools. Uh, there are quite a few schools who have, uh, you mentioned drones, but who have robots who do all kinds of these things. There are um, a couple of issues. Uh, one is that in order for a school to be that techy, um, you need two things. Uh, you need an enthusiast, uh, some kind of a teacher, or you know, a principal or somebody. Somebody has to be an enthusiast. And you also need to be um, in a good position. Um, I visit a lot of schools as part of uh, promoting our game Spoofy. I had to say Spoofy, otherwise I'm going to get fired. <laughs> um, so the game is Spoofy, go play it. Uh, but I visit a lot of schools and some of them you know, have, oh yeah, we have tablets and everything. Um, but also, um, I also visit schools uh, as part of career days mm-hmm. and so on. And my experience is that um, the um, gap between super, these techie schools who have tablets and robots and all kinds of things, and then uh, then there's the other end of the spectrum where the kids don't know anything about any IT topics. And when you go in, uh, there is a bit of sort of country and city uh, thing here, but it's not only that. And it could be there's a tiny, tiny country school and they have, you know, all the stuff because they have an enthusiast mm-hmm. teacher. But the problem I, th- I find is that it's not equal between schools. And um, your question was, sh- who should initiate it? Um, right now, there are quite a few, uh, like, for example, I visit schools. Um, we work closely with Telia. You asked about partners. Telia also finances the event downstairs heavily. Um, so they visit schools as well as uh, from their company. And they initiate from their side. Uh, I know there are schools who, are, who want guests as well. And what we have now determined between different parties, between the schools and, and the enthusiasts who go to schools, is that what we need, at least in Estonia, is some central organization. Mm-hmm. So that if you are from a school uh, and you think, maybe we should get someone to come in to talk about cyber or talk about IT stuff in general or, or anything related to this, then who do we call? Who do we contact? That there would be a place who would be able to uh, you know, direct people there. One problem as well is some people uh, ask for money for their visits, which is understandable. But of course, if you work for a private sector who has made it their mission, that company, mm-hmm. then they go for free, which is also uneven on the market. So there's uh, there are lots of sort of these um, organizational issues because there are there is interest from schools and there are people who are ready to go. But the biggest question is, how do we how do we get them to meet? Mm-hmm. How do we get them? And especially, how do we get this knowledge to uh, co- uh, schools that are not in the capital, that are not in big uh, big uh, towns, big cities? How do we get this knowledge to to smaller places? And I have because it goes with one of the earlier topics. I have one last thing. Uh, I had a visit from a school uh, because we also have school visits coming to CGI, uh, and these were kids who were studying cyber. And uh, we were talking about all kinds of things, and I asked them as well. So, and these were people who had chosen an elective cyber. And I asked them, so how many of you are thinking of uh, studying IT next year? They were all seniors. No hands. No hands. <laughs> and and I was shocked. And was, why? And I realized later because they were actually visiting from a, uh, from a smaller town that in many cases, we actually then walked around the office and what they saw, like with all tech offices, it was an empty office because everyone's working from home. (laughs) And that actually inspired them because they always thought that, oh, that this is something, a Tallinn thing or a Tartu thing, that you have to be from a big place. Uh, but I, um, I haven't seen most of my colleagues ever, uh, other than on screen, uh, that you can stay in your home hometown and you can work for big IT companies as well. This is an option and they need to know this. And that's, again, it's just information that we need to spread much larger scale as well. We can still take one question from the audience if there is anybody who wants to ask something from either our expert teachers or the young students that we have with us here. Any hands? Nope. Yes, there is still one person who likes to ask, so can we get the microphone there? So I'm asking more spoofy in the sense, um, uh, one of the areas that I'm working on, again, is cross-selling. So I'm not direct selling cybersecurity. I want to embed it in the way we think. So I was trying to leverage games on sustainability. So there's a lot of games that teach students how to be about sustainability in society. 
do you have any games in Estonia that teach children how to deal with the sustainability issues, like the recycle? There are games that teach them how to think sustainable. Uh, yes, um, I've come. Well, uh, I can't name any anything top of, from top of my head, but I have come across. Game, well, that sort of goes back to the original question, which was, you know, what should we do about gamification? Or um, one, of the, one of the problems I have with gamification is that a lot of people uh, call things gamification uh, when it's just not. Uh, and I'm unfortunately, a lot of these educational games and a lot of um, environmental or sustainability related games as well are boring. And um, and the fact that you have a choice in on screen doesn't make it a game. Uh, it, it's just a choice. And I have come across a lot of these, but there are also, um, I can't recall any right now, but I have seen um, games as well, which are aimed at younger kids or kids in general that, you know, talk about recycling or, or something like this. But they're usually quite small. Um, and um, I think what, what we need to sort of decide as well is what we want from a gamified topic or like or what we want from the game do we want it to be uh just like a, cl a quick clicky clicky or do we want as you said you know dungeons and dragons excitement something yes. to do uh that's sort of with our spoofy games oh you become a cyber hero you know the selling of it is like it's not just you solving cyber problems you're a hero you're saving the world mm -hmm. and uh and that's sort of the the selling point and i think that um uh, I haven't, at least I don't recall, seeing a, a sustainability or, or environmental game like this. If anybody knows, they can, you know, obviously correct me. But that's the thing that uh, that I would really like to see more of these. But I, knowing how much spoofy costs, I understand why why we don't have them. But, but you don't run it as an open source project. Uh, that it, well, uh, that's sort of the thing that there are different ways of approaching these yes. things. And uh, when it comes to open source, somebody still needs to be in charge of it and somebody needs to re take responsibility for it. And especially with educational games, um, I'll give you an example. With educational games, you have to be uh, conscious about certain things. Like, for example, in our game, we are very focused on making sure that there's diversity in the game, uh, that there is, um, that you don't go against, um, uh, go against other sort of norms um, that... Um, I'll, I'll give you a very real example. So we just developed our fifth world, a new world, and we had a situation there. We were thinking, okay, um, what do we call the joke name that the hackers gave to the store? And in English, it was uh, Hedgehog, Watermelon, and Sons. So Hedgehog, Watermelon is the internet phenomenon. But we thought, what are we going to do it in Estonian? So in Russian, uh, we put it Jožik Brznožik, which is a hedgehog without a nose. Um, but in Estonian, we thought, okay, there's this old cartoon, Hedgehog in the Fog. Uh, we'll put, put that, but then we didn't for two reasons. Uh, one, uh, it's an old Soviet cartoon, which politically right now is not the best time. And two, uh, kids today, they don't really know it except for, and I asked my teenager, like, hey, do you know what uh, C. Ludus is? And he went, huh, yeah. <laughs> and you know why? Because if you go to YouTube and you put in C. Ludus, the, the hedgehog in fog, you get a version that that's the top search version uh, where it's that cartoon with new voiceover. Um, it's not, how, how should I put it? Naughty voiceover? <laughs> you can guess. Use your imagination. And that's the number one search. So we can't put that in our game for kids. <laughs> uh, but that's the pro, uh, that's sort of, I'm, I'm a bit weary of, of certain open source things unless there is somebody in charge to make sure that these things don't happen. But otherwise, yes, open source is, is one way to do it. We're actually uh, running out of time now, but I would I would very much love to wrap it up with actually uh, giving the floor of like very shortly to two of you here. And to, to just tell us uh, in a way, if I was your classmates and I wouldn't be interested in cybersecurity at all, mm -hmm. why should I investigate or, or like get more interested in that sense as well? If you could just say one, two sentences, why cyber is sexy? Why should I look into it? It's important and it can be really fun. That's my take. All right. Yeah, I also think it's it's really fun and uh, everyone should definitely know about it. 
All right. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it's your data that you're, mm. you know, protecting and everything. All right. I would like to ask uh, you to join me for a round of applause for these ladies on the stage. Thank you.